folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. And yeah, I'm wearing my Ghostbusters t-shirt, you know, which I just wore it, um, last year, you know, when I did some of my other reviews. Well, anyway, I want to support it because, you know, i am always been a huge fan of Ghostbusters. It became one of my favorite movies as a kid. But not only that, the 80s was one of my favorite decades of all time. I was born in 1985, which is 30 years ago. Yeah, hard to believe, and I grew up ever since. But I always experienced it when I was very little. I always watch all these favorite shows that I love. You know, a lot of cartoons that's on Saturday mornings, as well as Sunday and weekday mornings and afternoons. And, and then, of course, we got cable and all this other stuff. And I got to watch all these classic 80s movies back then. Well, anyway, there was a movie that came out five years ago, set back in time, <laughs> it might as well be, to a movie that actually got the idea by using a raunchy comedy that was very similar to Back to the Future and The Hangover. And it's called Hot Tub Time Machine. That's right, the original Hot Tub Time Machine, not the sequel that follows it, which turned out to be a disaster, and not a very good one at that, because <laughs> they pretty much throw in a lot of random jokes and all this other crap in the mix, and, and of course it's basically the whole premise of the film about, you know, solving the mystery by finding Lou's killer. Since the killer actually shot Lou in the nuts with a shotgun. And it's just, uh, oh man, they wound up going, traveling back or forward in time by using the hot tub time machine. And they wound up, you know, 10 years into the future. So we end up meeting Adam Jr. and all that. Yeah, and what a bad experience that film turned out to be. It didn't have any heart whatsoever. It just become just another random cash grab, you know, just so they can make more money. Yeah, it, was, it actually became a box office failure. <laughs> but this movie, of course, was more of an actual premise that really worked. I mean, at first, I, I almost think of it as like maybe another ripoff of The Hangover. But technically speaking, it was one of the better ones. Because I know the previous uh, Hangover ripoff turned out to be I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell, which was an independent film. And it turns out it was, it was a forgettable piece of crap. Nothing special, but I guess that's what they were going for after The Hangover came out that year. Yeah, and that became a, a surprise hit. But this movie was more of a sleeper hit. It actually made uh, some money at the box office, not as much. It wasn't a highly successful film. At this rate, it's it's probably more underrated than it ever before. It also became one of my top favorites of 2010. I would definitely put this on my best list, along with Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and Toy Story 3, as well as Obsession and then all the other films that I like. And this is, of course, the unrated version that came out on Blu-ray, which also has the digital copy included. And it also has a theatrical version that I saw in theaters in Second Run at, in Pasadena at the Academy Theater. And I remember I laughed out loud at, at how funny this movie was, and it actually had a lot of heart to it, unlike the sequel. And it actually shows what was it like if, they, if these guys alone, four guys, had wound up um, going back in time to the year 1986 uh, inside a hot tub that was built in. <laughs> and they wound up actually experience what, what the 80s actually looked like. Even when um, you know Jacob, who was played by Clark Duke, actually knew exactly how different <laughs> you know their um, experience were at the time. So it's like, wow. I mean, this is basically what it is. It's a throwback of the 80s that we all grew up with. 
I mean, I love the 80s too. And the fact that it takes back to 1986 is really surprising because it was also the year that my brother was born. And <laughs> that's pretty much how they went for it. So, yeah. And they have a lot of extras in this movie, but not as much. You know, it only has some deleted scenes and and some small theatrical promo spots that they use, which I guess was supposed to be featurettes, but it was nothing more. And it's just, of course, both cuts, and that's it. But I think it deserves more extras than, than this. And a lot of stuff that they, they put in, but I guess that's the only way we can take it. So, yeah. So anyway, um, the movie stars John Cusack, who's also the co-producer of this film from his production company, New Crime. Rob Coldry from the TV show, you know, Children's Hospital, yeah, which is on Adult Swim. Craig Robinson, you know, from The Office. You know, Clark Duke, he was in the movie Sex Drive, and then as well as Kick-Ass, Chevy Chase, you know, from Vacation, and Caddyshack, and all the other 80s films that he's been in, so there's a plus, Colleen Wolf, Crispin Glover, from Back to the Future, yep, definitely a good appearance for him to be in this movie, yeah, he actually plays the, uh, the one-armed bellhop, Sebastian Stan, who later went on to do the film Captain America, The First Adventure, along with The Winter Soldier. Lizzie Kaplan, from the movie Cloverfield. Yeah, she was very good in this movie, by the way. Yeah. Crystal Lowe. Kelly Stewart. Lindsay Fonseca. Charlie McDermott. Jesse Perret. And William Sepka. It's written by John Heald, along with Sean Anders and John Morris, and it's directed by Steve Pink, best known for directing the movie Accepted. The movie begins set in the present time. Three friends, Adam Yates, Nick Weber Anu, and Lou Dorchin, all played by John Cusack. Craig Robinson and Rob Coldry are spending their miserable times in their lives. Adam has just been broken up by a second girlfriend, you know, actually leaving all of his stuff behind by putting all these red dot stickers and leaving a message on his answer machine and, and sending some cute cards to tell him that it's over between them. He also uh, has a 20-year-old nephew named Jacob, who's played by Clark Duke, who wants up living inside his basement, you know, playing his video game called Second Life. Yeah, sort of a, uh, <laughs> a prison game or some sort on his laptop, already trying to figure out who his father was, and, and he's basically staying over while his mother's away. Also... Nick wants up um, working at a job dog spa where he basically you know have all the dogs um, do a lot of exercise and a lot of cleaning and and all this other stuff that they had to do yeah including that scene where he had to take off the dog owner's uh, car keys inside his butt yeah all that nasty poop around that he had on his hands yeah, really messed up. While Lou wants up uh, drinking while driving on his car, listening to the song Home Sweet Home by Motley Crude. And suddenly, once he drives inside his garage, yeah, he wants up uh, stepping into the brakes and suddenly wants up getting knocked out by carbon monoxide poisoning, which sent him to the hospital. So once uh, Adam and Nick had arrived, along with uh, Nick's wife Courtney, yeah, they began to find out if, if part of this might be his suicide attempt, which turned out it wasn't. So then Adam found out that maybe the best idea for this, for all of their problems, is having to go to a ski trip, which is called Kodiak 
Valley Ski Resort so that way they can have the whole time together you know, along with uh, Jacob around so they just you know they book in a room where they actually meet a one-arm bellhop named Phil Webmayer who's played by Crispin Glover yeah, he's very good in this so they actually uh, picked the room that they once stayed in you know when they were very young <clears throat> And they also spotted a hot tub, which for a while was actually broken. Yeah, everything just seems run down, as it seems, and yeah, nothing much. And once they opened the hot tub, it, it was filled with dead squirrels and raccoons inside. They're just hanging around, you know, drinking and doing all this other stuff until suddenly the hot tub has finally um, started working again, where they actually meet a mysterious repairman who's played by Chevy Chase, who might also be uh, the inventor, or at this rate, you know, that they actually call him Fodder Time. Uh, who knows? So once they hook up the hot tub, they actually wind up diving in and just having the best time of their lives, you know, just, you know, drinking and doing drugs and, and hanging out with a lot of crew. Yeah, they even had... Uh, <laughs> A bear mascot to join in. <laughs> Even a lot of ladies around too, you know, taking off their clothes and you know having fun. But what they didn't know though was that the hot tub was actually turned out to be a built-in time machine. So that's when they started, you know, having their hangovers and and suddenly <laughs> and suddenly they wound up being awakened to the year nineteen eighty-six. Yep. And they didn't even knew about it until later on when they wound up uh, having fun, you know, skiing, stuff until they noticed everybody was wearing 80s fashion. And then they went inside the lodge and they actually spotted a lot of, a lot of 80s retro memorabilia, you know, such as the, uh, the TVs that's showing uh, MTV, you know, the Ronald Reagan speech and Elf. A lot of 80s music uh, being played in the background. A lot of, a lot of fashion that they went into. You know, they had a lot of guys and girls. You know, wearing, you know, a Miami Vice shirt. And you know, where's the beef? And all this other stuff. And they got Super Mario Brothers, arcade games, and they even had the uh, you know, leg warmers and all that. <laughs> so that was really cool. Yeah, which I know uh, Nick actually told the girl who's wearing the Where's the Beef shirt that if Michael Jackson is black. And once she, she said yes, he started screaming and running away, only to find out that they really did actually travel back in time to 1986. Yeah, and I know you also saw um, John Cusack actually saying, Man, I should have never have bought you back in this trip. I hate this decade. So they knew they were stuck in 1986, which is celebrating its Winterfest 86 at the resort, which heavy metal rock band Poison was going to be played there. So that means they got to change everything just so they can basically have a second chance in their lives. And they knew something bad was going to happen. Yeah, once they started looking at the mirrors, which I know they did, you know, they saw their younger selves. You know, Nick actually had a high top haircut. Yeah, Adam has with round hair like that, and and Lou actually has uh, long hair, just like all these heavy metal rock bands, you know. And, and of course, Jacob is just you know Jacob, yeah, you know, with the nerdy glasses and everything. But he started flickering, you know, kind of like what Lou was flickering in the second movie, yeah, you know, which I know that was bad, but you get the point. And so yeah, so they basically just spend their time, you know, meeting a lot of people that they met when they were young. You know, Adam suddenly uh, meets his first girlfriend, who turns out to be a ditz named Jenny Stedmeyer, who's played by Lindsay Fonseca. Which of course we, as he may have remembered, you know, she was the first girlfriend that actually stabbed him in the eye with a fork. Yeah, which I know this was going to happen to him later on, though, once he tries to break up. But, of course, he's just spending time with her for a while because, 
and she was having fun. But I, but even he knew that this was going to happen. While Lou wants to be beaten up by a ski patrol bully named Blaine, who's played by Sebastian Stan. Yep, and he keeps beating him up all this time. Yeah, even right in front of uh, Jacob. Yeah, which I know this is going to happen a lot. And so Nick wants up uh, joining in a band, which is part of a contest. You know, so he gets to actually sing in front of the whole crowd, which I know he did later on when he sang the song Jesse's Girl and and of course uh, Black Eyed Peas' uh, Let's Get It Started, which I know the original song was called Let's Get Retarded. You know, okay, we get the point. And just trying to fix something that failed the first time, and they're trying to get right back to it. You know, so before you know. The repairman shows up trying to fix the hot tub and and try to fix everything right as it seems so that way they can go back to their home. But of course, um, after Adam was already being broken up later on or or even before that, yeah, he wants up bumping into a music journalist named April Drennan, who was played by Lizzie Kaplan, which sad to say he refrains from talking to her because you know he didn't want to change everything from the past which I know this was their plan actually was to not change everything that happened in the past but they wound up doing it anyway <laughs> but he figured that you know since this was going to happen he decided he'll, she'll just talk to him anyway and I agree because I, I thought April was the right choice for Adam instead of Jenny because Jenny was, was what started this whole uh, madness to, to go on you know of course because we had Adam Jr. later on so <laughs> I wish that sequel never happened yeah because he did call her um, fat and, and trucker hips and all that you know before you know she was gonna stab him in the eye with the fork all this time you know, you know Adam was just basically you know drinking you know taking drugs and started writing poetry yeah, very bad poetry, and you know, and and already you know <laughs> Jacob was struggling because he's still flickering, and although he doesn't flicker as much, but you know he's trying to see what's going on here and trying to help everybody out so they won't they won't fail. But of course, they even did found out that part of the whole idea of time traveling that started to happen was because they actually accidentally poured in a can of Chernobyl yeah which was a Russian drink I know this is sort of a joke in that sort of way because I know in real life back in 1986 there was a Chernobyl disaster that happened in Russia which I know that also leads to the point where where Blaine actually spotted um, the, the can which he had on, along with all the other gadgets that they found inside their backpacks and everything yeah, and I know in their room they actually showed some movie posters and all this other stuff that they had in. Yeah, I know they have posters for Right Nights, Rocky IV, and Red Dawn. Yeah, he was even watching Red Dawn as well. But they also had a Rambo Free poster on there, which is supposed to be Rambo First Blood Part Two, which that's exactly what they should have put in. It would have made sense, because then they would have got it more accurate this way. They also could have put some more of all the other 80s stuff like uh, Transformers, Thundercats, and even uh, Gem and the Holograms. That would have been cool. Then, then it could be part of that. Yeah, but either way, that, that's the way they went for. So, of course, you know, and once again, we get Phil, the bellhop, you know, and they always actually had a, uh, a running joke in the movie where when you know that his arm was going to be you know, cut off, you know, especially when he started doing the ice sculpture with a chainsaw, he slips into ice and the chainsaw was going to fall into his arm. It failed. And then his arm was going to get caught in, in the elevator. Yeah, it failed too. And, and <laughs> until maybe the last shot. And I know <laughs> even Lou was enjoying that too. But then, of course, Lou also bumps into... Jacob's mother, which I know they actually spotted their mom um, earlier in the film. And of course he does do some crazy things to her, such as 
actually having sex with her, which causes uh, Jacob to be very furious because he was about to tackle him, but once again he, he was starting to disappear, and he went into the future, and then when he came back, <laughs> he finally gets his revenge by stopping uh, Lou by actually making sex with his mother, and then of course, um, you know, already you know feeling broken up and down, and you know, Nick was already you know calling the his supposedly his wife, which apparently she was nine years old at the time. So I know now they think this was sort of a prank call, which I know that was hilarious. And and I, I know even before this had happened, they were already making bets. All it causes that big uh, <laughs> messed up scene. But yeah, that's what pretty much what they were doing all this time. And once you know, Lou tried to stop uh, Blaine again from stealing the can. Yeah, he actually did, but he keeps getting beat up, and he failed at every shot that he tried. But then he wants up getting his revenge, and got him, and <laughs> they got the can, and then they decided to, to leave all the way back to their hot tub so they can finally go back in time. Well, Lou just decided he'll just stay anyway. And then when they finally came back from the hot tub time machine, well, they saw a... A message uh, from Lou that he actually now is married with uh, Jacob's uh, mother, and he's already, of course, a lead singer for uh, <laughs> for his own band called uh, Molly Lou instead of Crude. Yeah, which which you're gonna show his actual music video on MTV, which is a song "Home Sweet Home." Now Adam finally gets. Um, the girl that he never thought he would have, named April, <laughs> which we saw in the movie. So now has a beautiful home, and and Nick, however, um, is now a music producer since that song he just did, and it, it was like the best dream of his life. And and of course, you know, Jacob is just you know very happy, even though he felt a little you know concerned. Now that Lou is becoming his father, so that's kind of messed up, but still. <laughs> but either way, you know, they just had a good time. You know, they, they spent time at their house, you know, having lunch together and talking about the best times they had once they were in 1986. And, and then we got to see the, the music video of Molly Lou, and yep, then the movie ends. And I gotta say, it's very funny, hilarious, and a very feel-good movie that I really enjoy. This movie never gets old. I, I think this is definitely the best film that they ever had for its time, because I know with all the rip-offs that we're getting these days, this one actually works. Because it had a lot of smart writing that they put into, a lot of great characters that we really look up for, and a lot of 80s nostalgia that we grew up with. I mean, they had a lot of 80s music, some TV shows, and all this other stuff that they had. The fashion, the look, the, all that memorabilia that they put in the mix of the film. I thought it worked so well that it's what the 80s is definitely supposed to look like when you make a movie like this. And it's definitely like Back to the Future meets uh, The Hangover. And I like that. I like the idea. Also, the fact that most of this movie did kind of remind me of the 80s film from 1985, which was directed by Savage Steve Holland, same director who went on to do Eat the Cat from, from the 90s that aired on Fox, called Better Off Dead, which also stars John Cusack, which he actually plays, and get this, a character who actually had a girlfriend, he dumped him for another guy, and also was attempt to commit suicide especially when he's already you know taking the risk by uh, skiing his all the way through so he thought maybe this will solve his problems until he finally meets uh, a ski instructor who's actually a foreign exchange student yeah <laughs> there's something right there it kinda seemed very similar to uh, to that movie because also, John Cusack was also skiing with his friends, so it kind of resembles to that. 
Yeah, I, I know I remember that scene where that paper boy, he wants up uh, owing him $2, and he keeps, you know, <laughs> doing that runny joke all by chasing him around saying, I want my $2! That was actually uh, one of my favorite 80s films at the time, from 85. And I know John Cusack actually hated that film. I mean, at this rate, he was having problems working with Savage Steve Holland as a director. Because I know they both went on to do another film together, you know, called One Crazy Summer with Bobcat Gulfwade and, and Demi Moore, which I also loved too. Um, but I guess, you know, he had a few with them and... That's why he didn't care for this movie so much. Yeah, especially since he just did a film that's that it actually reminded him by. So maybe he sort of has his change of pace. But who knows. But yeah, John Cusack was actually very good in this movie too. And, and, and you know, he was cool. I, I think he did a great job actually, you know, playing a character that's sort of having his problems, you know, that needed to be solved. And, and he actually has fins of his own. That does kind of take you back, because, you know, since he was indeed a teenager um, back in the 80s, when he did a lot of 80s teen flicks, besides Better Off Dead, he did do movies like uh, uh, Sixteen Candles, you know, John Hughes film, and, and of course he even did the movie Say Anything, which I also love, by the way. It's a very good film, and many others that he did, especially with his sister, Joan. Yeah, so that was cool, you know, and the fact that they throw in Crispin Glover in the movie too was was an instant plus since he did Back to the Future, you know, with Michael J. Fox, and I know he has been in a film with him too before that called High School USA, and he did a lot of stuff like this, so I guess he knew he wanted to do a movie exactly like Back to the Future since he wasn't available in the sequels, you know, since they couldn't offer them, you know, that's a shame. But I, I like the fact that he played a, a one-armed bellhop, where part of this actually becomes a runny joke. Since Lou actually hated the guy, since he's so rude at first. But he turned out to be a sweet guy. I love uh, Craig Robinson ever since The Office, because he's always been this funny. And he was actually very good in this movie, you know, playing uh, a guy who's, you know, who's having hard times and, and he wants to get into the music business, and I know he did, thank goodness. Yeah, Rob Coldry, of course, acting like a complete dick at times, doing some stupid things until he turns out to be a nice guy after that. So, because he has sort of a change of pace at heart, you know, even though he's been going through a lot of shit, but <laughs> you get the idea. And of course, uh, Clark Duke as Jacob, you know, he was very good in this movie. I mean, coming from films like like Sex Drive and kick-ass, and, and of course he was in the TV show Hearts of Fire. Yeah, I think this is the kind of character I can deal with, because, you know, he he's basically what he is, a, a kid who's actually, you know, having to deal with what, what's going on. But I guess they knew they wanted to throw that in, because, you know, they always like to have, you know, kids, you know, acting up at, at that particular age. So, yeah. Uh, Chevy Chase definitely stole the show for me, too, when he played the repairman. Yeah, he was definitely very good in this movie. And you know, since I know he was in all the 80s movies, you know, since he's part of the Saturday Night Live cast, yeah, he's, he's always been funny. I'm just glad he was in this movie, too. Um, but definitely uh, Lindsay Kaplan, though, however, yeah, she was very good. And I think it worked so well as uh, April. They had good chemistry. With Adam, you know, and John Cusack, of course. Yeah, much better chemistry than <laughs> than Jenny, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of wish I saw more of them because one of the biggest moments, though, was when Adam started to mention about you know his experience that when he was a kid, he was going to go out to um, to a pizza place uh, that. Um, his dad refused not to take him to because, unfortunately, because he's always taking his kid and everybody to to get some steak sandwiches. But unfortunately, when they chose the pizza place that he wanted to go, everybody actually got sick. Yeah, and they all got killed, including his father. So, 
and suddenly his father actually blames him for that. You know, that was kind of a, a bad moment that he mentioned, but but it was actually good that he actually made a conversation with April, so he figured maybe he could fix everything that needs to be solved, and hopefully things will turn out good for the better. I mean, you never know. <laughs> yeah. It's a very fun movie. It's hilarious, and I enjoyed it. Had a lot of good heart to it. They knew that's what they were going to go for. Yeah, instead of just being, you know, just another uh, hangover ripoff with that sort of thing. But it's basically a tribute to all the 80s nostalgia that we had, we all love and grew up with. I know my family had a lot of good times and bad times uh, back in the 80s. They grew up with a lot of nostalgia that they had because I know my parents got married at the time. And I know my brother was born and you know, we were hanging out so we did a lot of stuff you know, before the 90s came along and, and I know we hang out even some more. Yeah, it, it was just one of my favorite times growing up. And I loved that. I'm glad we have movies like this. I just hope that, you know, nowadays they don't end up having some so many rip-offs where they just thinking, oh, we're, we're going to get yet another time-traveling movie where they're just going to have more problems. Which I know that's what they're going to be getting nowadays, but this one was very well made. And I, I'm just glad we had this, you know. Just sad that the sequel didn't turn out as good as we expected it to be, but then again, maybe the sequel was not needed in the first place. So, that's for sure. But anyway, check out Hot Tub Time Machine. You're definitely going to have a good time. It's just, you know, awesome. That's all I can say. So anyway, I give the movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.